Fireball governor. Now, what happens is this, these balls spin round as the steam pressure increases. The more they spin, the more they move up, that moves a lever which actually closes the valve that's letting the steam in. Okay, so as the steam increases, they go up, that moves the valve down, so the steam decreases again. Okay? This is what's called negative feedback, and it keeps the steam going into that steam engine constant. Without that, the steam engine would blow up, and we wouldn't have steam engines and the Industrial Revolution. So there's something about control that's going on in engineering. What I'd like you to think about is whether control uh, is a way of understanding human behavior as well. We've got very used to the idea of seeing behavior as something that's a reaction to a stimulus or something that we compute as an output. I'd just like you to look at this video and think about that idea. Can, what's happening is the person on the right is going to move a pen on a piece of paper. And they are, their pen is attached by a, a rubber band to the, to the pen of the person on the left. Okay? The person on the right uh, is just moving the pen. And the person left is following some kind of instruction. And you've got to work out what instruction the person on the left is following. Okay. You had to think about that? Actually, you could just talk to the person next to you, if you're sitting next to someone, and say what you think the instruction is that the person on the left is following. Okay. Okay, I think you've had a little bit of time, so carry on. Yeah. Okay, the, the common answer to this, I won't do a, a, a rote here, but the common answer to this is that the person on the left is either copying or doing the opposite of the person on the right. Okay? That's what we would expect if, we, if we're interpreting it by their behaviour, because there's this trace of their behaviour on a piece of paper. But actually, that's not what the instruction is. The person on the left is trying to keep the knot of that rubber band immediately above a dot on the piece of paper. So they're trying to control the location of the knot of the rubber band. So let's just watch this again. The rubber band is, the, rubber, the knot is not perfectly over the dot, but as soon as the person tries to pull it away on the right, the person on the left has to counteract that disturbance and pull it uh, in the opposite direction. So what's going on in the head of the person on the left is not what the behavior is. We can't interpret what someone's thinking or what their goals are just by looking at their behavior. Now, there's all kinds of ways we can go with this, but I think it's starting to tell us a little bit, which we'll move on to. The funny thing, oops, sorry, missed that. The interesting thing is that psychologists were aware of this many years ago. John Dewey wrote about the reflex arc. What we have is a circuit, not an arc or a broken circle. This circuit is more truly organic reflex because the motor response determines the stimulus just as truly as the stimulus determines, determines the movement. So behavior is controlling the stimulation and the sensory input in this, in this account, even though that's not what seems to be taken forward in a lot of the psychology that we do. Let's just look at this step by step. It's often useful to break this down into stages, even though it's a, a, a continuous process. We perceive some kind of state of the world. We compare it to our reference, our standard for that, the not over the dot. And then we engage in some kind of action to control that experience. And it's a bit like having something that's just right. And we've got lots of these just rights in our heads. Now, how do we do that? We actually control something in the environment. In this case, it's the rubber band. And in, the other, in this example, there was a, a person acting against, acting against that. If you're trying to, to stand up in a storm, it would be the, the storm that would be, go, that would be going against your ability to, to stand up. Now, 
This theory really expands upon this, so I'm not going to, uh, I mean, I'm going to illustrate this in some detail. These units are actually organized in a hierarchy, and this is how we manage complex things, okay? So this is a really neat piece of video um, that illustrates how these units are organized, okay? So it's only the outside, the lowest level unit, that is in touch with the environment. That's our senses and our, and our muscles. Everything else is internal, and it's all about how we're controlling and managing uh, those goals. But the idea that lower level things are concrete, about how we sort of manage our muscles, and we go up through sequences and procedures, but right at the top, we're trying to control much longer term things in our lives, like uh, the kind of person we are, or the kind of principles and rules that we have. And this whole process, as I say, is dynamic. It's not a step-by-step -step process. It's just going round all the time. That's in the theory. What other examples do we have of control in, in our real life? Um, I would suggest that tracking a caregiver, following the person, this is Lorentz uh, in an imprinting study, maintaining proximity to someone, to someone who's going to look after you. Obviously, this is important in attachment theory, which actually is partly based on these kind of accounts. Another kind of tracking study is uh, eye movement, when we're tracking anyone, like people leaving at the back of the room or, or whatever. It's a tracking process. Um, so there have been um, studies looking at tracking. About 15 or more studies have been published, and they actually show that when people control and track something, and as, as I say, I'm sh there are all kinds of real-world examples for this, it simply doesn't follow an input-compute-output um, process. It's a closed loop. And it, and it follows this pattern that we saw in the, in the closed loop diagram, that action acts against disturbances, so you get this uh, very high negative correlation between somebody's actions and the disturbance they're controlling against, and actually they keep their input quite constant, and therefore it doesn't actually correlate with either the environment or their behaviour. Now, I don't expect you to, to get this straight away, but these papers are out there. It's, it seems like a very interest, a very sort of clear sort of confirmation of, of these approaches of understanding control. And it wasn't, you know, at the time, this book uh, and its previous papers were very well used and praised by key figures. Carl Rogers, Thomas Kuhn, Hope, Herbert Maurer, the learning theorist, and Carver and Shire in social psychology have taken a version of perceptual control theory into social psychology. The other thing about this theory is even though it's not hit the mainstream in any particular domain. There is all kinds of ways that it's been applied, and I've got a website that just links to all the different ways that different people around the world have, have, have used this theory. So it's one that you know is is, is applicable to, to very uh, many sort of uh, areas, which is I find quite exciting. So just to summarise, what are the tenets of this theory? It's that control is fundamental to life, and we control our experiences. And this is achieved by this closed loop process of perceiving, comparing, and acting against something in the world. We organize control in hierarchies where long term goals are implemented by lower level goals. There are two other things in this theory. When a person tries to control the same experience in opposing directions, they get conflict, and this disrupts control. And you see this in, in all kinds of control systems. And then there's an, another process which is called reorganization which is the learning process in this theory. And this basically reduces conflict and optimizes control. And it's perceived, or it's proposed, that this learning process is related to what we're currently aware, aware of at any one time. So let's go back to the idea of inflexible control. What we're